But we begin the readout tonight with the man who assisted individual one with a hush money payment to an adult film star in the waning days of the 2016 presidential campaign. When it was ultimately determined, and this was days before the election, that Mr. Trump was going to pay the $130,000. In the office with me was Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer of the Trump Organization. He acknowledged to Alan that he was going to pay the $130,000 and that Alan and I should go back to his office and figure out how to do it. Trump's longtime personal attorney and fixer Michael Cohen testifying before the House Oversight Committee in 2019 about his role in orchestrating the scheme that ultimately sent him to prison. Well, now it could be Donald Trump's turn to face the music, as it appears increasingly likely that Trump will be indicted by Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, who's been investigating the case. If that happens, Cohen will likely be the key witness for the prosecution. And you can expect that Trump and his allies will escalate their attacks on Cohen and that it will get personal and ugly. Already, we've heard from many legal analysts, as well as from members of Team Trump, who call Cohen a flawed witness and say that relying on him as the linchpin of the case could prove highly problematic for the prosecution if, if, if it happens, as many believe that it will as soon as next week. And joining me now for his first interview since Michael Cohen completed his grand jury testimony is Cohen's attorney, Lanny Davis. It is good to see you. Nice to be here, Joy, in person. Yeah, in person. I know. It's, it's a new thing. We, we're, we're kind of in normalish world again. Um, let's go through this, because the, the attacks on your client have been pretty vicious for now. I'm, I'm assuming they'll get worse. Um, Donald Trump called him a rat multiple times. Um, his lawyer, uh, Trump, uh, Joe Tacopina, attacked him and said um, he's a fraud, he's a liar, he's a convicted perjurer in, the, in Trump world and outside of the Trump world. That's sort of this, this, the, the preview to what we're going to see. But when people say that he would have a credibility problem in front of a jury, that he would be a liability to the prosecution, they're talking about him pleading guilty to crime. So I, I want to go through with you what those crimes are, because it, it begs the question, right, what did he plead guilty to? He pleaded guilty to tax evasion, making false statements to a federally insured bank, causing an unlawful corporate contribution, making an excessive campaign contribution, and making false statements to Congress. I want to go through them one by one. Let's talk about the tax evasion case. Um, did he, he, he pleaded guilty to it, so he did it. So uh, he pled guilty uh, when he was coerced on a Friday afternoon. His lawyer told him that on Monday he would be indicted with his wife on this completely concocted and baseless tax claim, as well as all the other counts. And he wouldn't have an opportunity to meet with the prosecutor. So they gave him from a Friday afternoon to Monday to decide whether to plead guilty. So the guilty plea on that issue was coerced. Mm -hmm. And I can prove to you that there was no even slight evidence of a tax fraud What's claim. What's the proof of that? Well, let's start with the fact that H&R Block, we all know, is an expert on tax. One out of 150 million people in the last year that this was uh, done by H&R Block uh, are criminally prosecuted. Uh, most people in the millions of dollars of not paying taxes are treated in civil. There was literally nothing that the prosecution presented as evidence of tax criminal fraud. If in $1.3 million is the amount of money, tens of millions of dollars have been settled civilly is all that was alleged against Michael. And that was spread over five years and created five counts. So there was something about the prosecution case that was so concocted that had he gotten his day in court, it probably uh, would have been dismissed before he ever had a trial. Right. Let's go on to this, this question of this HELOC, that he took a this HELOC. This is the silliest one of all. Okay, we're going to go into it. So, so this is him using a HELOC, for those who don't know. It's essentially use the equity in your own home, sort of borrow from yourself. And he used that money um, to pay Stormy Daniels this $130,000. So th this is why the cook... Uh, case of the Southern District, we were told by Jeffrey Berman, the U.S. attorney, that he got a phone call from Trump's attorney general interfering in the Cohen case. So there's something wrong here. When you take your own money, you draw down $130,000 at Donald Trump's instruction, which is what the Southern District published in a filing. He instructed Michael to pay that $130,000 to avoid the Stormy Daniels affair coming out, alleged affair, right before the election for political reasons. That's what the federal prosecutor said. Now they're saying $130,000 with $8 million of equity in his apartment. That's his money. And he drew down $130,000 because Trump didn't want to be involved or have any connection. He wanted a, he wanted a separation from the How in 
is it possible that $130,000 with $8 million of equity behind it could possibly be a crime? Now, they're claiming that the, the lie to the bank is about the valuation, about how much equity he really had. Actually, they're not claiming that. They're claiming that he had written down a somewhat mistaken assessment of uh, assets in another venue. But yeah. banks don't care about what you write down on a bank statement. If yeah. you've got equity and if you don't pay back your own money, they don't care either, but they've right. got the equity. It's a completely absurd and is never, it would be dismissed had it ever gone to trial. But as I said, they said to him on a Friday afternoon through his lawyer, refused to meet with him. We're going to charge you with a 78-page or 80-page indictment on Monday morning, and we're going to indict your wife. So this has never been given full airing. And part of what I'd like to say about his credibility is, let's remember, Michael Cohen, on July 2, 2018, decided to tell the truth. Since that day, he has been under oath before congressional committees, before the intelligence committees, before prosecutors. He went into a grand jury just recently. Uh, under oath, has never once, not once, has anyone said there's a fact untrue about all that testimony. And he's been so vindicated, the Attorney General of New York depended on his testimony to bring a civil case of fraud against Donald Trump. So everything that you quoted, Mr. Tacopina, who I know from other venues, yeah. uh, he uses adjectives and attack words. I know lawyers, when they use attack words and they don't use facts, it means they don't have facts. Not a single fact has undermined anything that Michael Cohen has said under oath, in contrast to Mr. Trump, who refuses to show up. And when he is under oath, he takes the Fifth Amendment. There's another one that I think is people don't think about enough, and this is the, uh, the false statements to the U.S. Congress. Now, yeah. those were not about uh, Stormy Daniels, right? Those were actually about a, tr a, a, a Trump Tower or, or Trump. Uh, again, Can you explain that. Facts get in the way of rhetoric. Yeah. A false statement to Congress is a serious crime. Yeah. Number one, he was directed to make those false statements by Donald Trump. And th what were they about? They were it about. Was, this is the uh, absurdity of uh, the uh, assertion that it's a crime. Yeah. So he was having conversations, negotiations about building Trump Tower in Moscow. Right. Trump said to him, I don't want you to say that during the campaign. I want you to lie and say there are no discussions. Even even while there were discussions. So Michael said there were three discussions rather than 10. Now, let me repeat that. That's the false statement called a crime that will undermine his credibility with the jury. Trump tells him to lie, and he had three, which is what he said, rather than 10, which is what happened. Yeah. That's the crime. And it's done at the instruction and for the benefit of, not Michael Cohn, Donald Trump. Every juror who's going to be sitting in the jury box is going to ask the question, did Donald Trump pay the money to hush up Stormy Daniels, because right before the election, he, he was worried about the effect on the electorate if that came out. That's the only question a jury is going to be deciding. And by the way, as much as I say Michael Cohen can be trusted and is credible based on this record I just laid out for you, Michael Cohen isn't needed in this case. All of these pundits and pontificators and lawyers who uh, are speaking on TV, especially another rival network, mm -hmm. have no clue what the evidence is in this case. I'm in the room, I know what the evidence is. They don't, so they're speculating, and they have no idea that this case is surrounded by documents, evidence, and facts. I think this case is extremely strong. I hear people say it's a weak case. It's because they have no clue, no facts. They're just speculating. You, you mentioned Mr. Berman, um, and, and, and you did mention that he has this chapter in his book where he talks about getting a call from William Barr, who we do know was acting as a fixer for Donald Trump and as attorney general at the same time, lied about the Mueller report, et cetera. But what you said sounds like you're alleging some intimidation tactics against Mr. Berman. And, maybe against Mr. Cohen as well. Well, no, no question that Mr. Berman wrote that in a book. He waited a little long to talk about what was a basically criminal obstruction of justice, even if the attorney general does it, when he calls a U.S. attorney and tries to interfere in a case. And something was amiss in the prosecutors not allowing Michael Cohen to come in and talk, even on the Friday before the Monday they threatened to indict him. I know as a lawyer, we called after and said, can we come in and present you with new evidence on Mr. Trump? And the criminal lawyer that I was working with said, the first time in his career, the Southern District prosecutor said, no, we don't want your information. And they dropped everything. And the only person prosecuted who went to jail right. and the whole Trump organization was Michael Cohn. Jeffrey Berman gave us the answer. There was pressure from Washington. And that call from the attorney general 
there were other involvements from Washington that interfered in the administration of justice. I would love to see the inspector general of the Justice Department investigate what happened in that time period when Trump was interfering and targeting Michael Cohen. And, and he was then, um, he was released from jail due to COVID um, and then was put back in, or at least there was a threat to reincarcerate him. And what was a, that behind a, that? Great that I can get into this. So this is now a federal judge who was told by the Justice Department, by the same prosecutors that coerced him into these uh, guilty pleas, f filed papers and said, we're sending him back to prison because he refused to sign a paper, but it had nothing to do with the fact that he was writing a book about Trump. The judge heard the evidence, and the judge said what was told to me by the federal government prosecutors was not true. Now, that's a nice way of saying lying. He was sent back to prison out of vengeance to force him to sign a paper that he wouldn't write a book, and the judge ordered him out of prison. People in the Southern District of New York and the Bureau of Prisons had to have been embarrassed, and Mr. Berman tells us how, why that happened. It had to come from somebody in Washington.